Good morning, everyone. Welcome to all of you as we worship together today on this third Sunday in the season of Easter. And we're very happy to have you with us, whether you're tuning in for, from near or from afar. It's always great to worship with you. We are going to uh, invite you to send in your prayer requests, as usual this morning, via Facebook texting. If you send those in, we will include those in our prayers today. We begin with our gathering song, Now the Green Blay Rises, a great old French carol that is a, an Easter carol and um, a lovely melody. Now the green blade rises from the buried grain. We that in dark earth many days have lain. Love lives again that with the dead has been. Love is come again like wheat are rising green. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. Holy and righteous God, you are the author of life and you adopt us to be your children. Fill us with your words of life that we may live as witnesses to the resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.
A reading from Acts. Peter addressed the people. You Israelites, why do you wonder at this, or why do you stare at us, as though by our own power or piety we had made him walk? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our ancestors, has glorified his servant, Jesus, who you handed over and rejected in the presence of Pilate though he had decided to release him. But you rejected the Holy and Righteous One and asked to have a murderer given to you. And you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. And by faith in his name, his name itself has made this man strong, who you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given him this perfect health in the presence of all of you. And now, friends, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers. In this way, God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, that his Messiah would suffer. Repent, therefore, and turn to God, so that your sins may be wiped out. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God. As a special Easter anthem today, we're going to replay a video of a recording made by the Association of Lutheran Church Musicians, specifically for Lutheran churches during this Easter season. We played it on Easter Sunday, but we're going to play it again for you this morning, both because it is so beautiful and because if you look very carefully of the thousand or so faces you see on screen, you will actually see a few Trinity members who contributed their voice to this project. So please enjoy this Easter anthem, Christ the Lord is Risen Today. Thank you. 
A reading from 1 John. See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this. When he is revealed, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. And all who have this hope in him themselves, just as he is pure. Everyone who commits sin is guilty of lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he was revealed to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one abides who abides in him sins. No one who sins has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Everyone who does what is right is righteous just as he is righteous. The word of the Lord. Thanks. Thanks be to God. Our Easter Gospel today is taken from the 24th chapter of the Gospel according to St. Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus himself stood among the disciples and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified, and they thought they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, Why are you frightened, and why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a ghost does not have flesh and bones like you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. While in their joy they were disbelieving and still wondering, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses to these things. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Good morning, Trinity children of God. Today we're going to hear the story about two people in the Bible who at first were sad and discouraged, but then something really special happened, and it changed the way they looked at Good morning, Trinity children of God. Today we're going to hear the story about two people in the Bible who at first were sad and discouraged, but then something really special happened, and it changed the way they looked at things. Jesus had just been crucified, and Easter morning had passed, and Cleopas and his friend were traveling together, walking down a road toward the village of Emmaus. They were kind of feeling lost and talking about all the things that had happened. Soon, another traveler, a man, came along and joined in their walk, and he asked them what they had been talking about. They responded, You mean you don't know what happened to Jesus? The man said he did not, so they started to share the story with him, how Jesus had been found guilty, was hung on the cross, placed in the tomb, and the tomb being found empty, just days later, and the women who went to the tomb now convinced that Jesus was alive. I'm going to let you in on a little secret. In all that time walking together, there was something those men didn't yet know, that the man who joined them on the road that day really was Jesus. They were never expecting to see him there, so they just didn't recognize him yet. 
When the three of them arrived at Emmaus, it was getting late in the day, so they invited the man to stay overnight, and they shared a meal together. And as the man blessed the bread, suddenly their eyes were opened, and they knew just who he was. It was their friend Jesus. Then just as suddenly as he had come to them on that walk, Jesus left them, and they talked about what had just happened, and then returned to Jerusalem to share their joy with others that Jesus was, in fact, alive. Sometimes life gets that way. We might feel a little lost or get distracted by things that are happening to us, and we might need a little help to see that Jesus is still with us. There's a famous picture. It's actually a photograph of some snow with dirt showing through. And when the person who took the photograph developed it, he saw something he never expected to see in it. Can you see the face of Jesus anywhere in this image? Some people, when they first look, they need a little time to study the photo in order to see Jesus' face. Others need a hint or someone to show them where to look on the page or how to hold the paper, maybe backwards or up to some light, in order to best see Jesus' face. If you're having some trouble, here's a colored version to show you where to look. It's pretty amazing, isn't it? Whether it's on the road or looking at a picture, or somewhere else. Because of the promise of Easter, as children of God, we know just where to find Jesus, right where we are. He walks wherever we walk, we can pray and talk to him anytime, and we can see his love through people in our lives. Our parents, our friends, our teachers, neighbors, even complete strangers, who show us that kind of love every day. And we too, in so many ways, with our hands and hearts and through our words, can show and tell others that Jesus is always there for them too, even when they're having trouble seeing it or believing it. You and I can help them see that they are never, ever alone. Dear Jesus, let's pray. When we find ourselves sad or discouraged, help us to always trust you are there. May we too be witnesses of your love to others each day. Thanks for listening, everyone. Have a great week, and I'll see you again soon. Thank you, Todd. Dear friends in Christ, grace and peace to you from God, our Heavenly Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Do you know who picked out your name? Well, for most of us, I suppose that would be our parents. I know that in my case, my mom and dad had a little bit of a dispute about what I should be named. My mother liked the name Clay or Clayton. She thought it sounded sort of dignified. My dad, on the other hand, had had it in mind that I would be named Elmer. <laughs> Elmer John Schmidt would have been my name if my dad had prevailed, and I would be known as the Reverend Elmer Schmidt, or Pastor Elmer. I have to tell you, I much prefer Pastor Clay. I'm glad my mom won that dispute. Sometimes people change their names so that they, they have a name that fits more who they think they are. There was a man named Reginald Dwight who decided that that was not a name that was fitting for a rock star. And so he changed his name to Elton John. And that certainly has worked out well for him. Martin Luther changed his name. He was born to a man named Hans Luder, L-U-D-E-R, and that was Luther's given name, Martin Luther. But as he became a Bible scholar and he studied Greek, he began to realize that the Greek word for freedom is eleutheria. You can hear that luth in the middle. So he changed his name from Luther to Luther so that he would have the idea of freedom captured right in the middle of his name, always reminding him that he was set free from his sin by the gospel. In 1934, there was a Baptist minister from the United States who traveled to Germany because he wanted to study the Reformation. And he became so enamored of the work of Martin Luther, he decided to come back and adjust his name. His name was Michael King Sr. And when he returned, he decided to change his name to Martin Luther King Sr. He had a five-year-old son who was Michael King Jr. And he also changed his name to Martin Luther King Jr. And how fitting indeed it is that both of them had freedom at the center of their names and that it was Martin Luther King Jr. who led our nation 
in bringing freedom to the people of African American descent. Martin Luther King Jr. has been on our minds these last weeks and months as we have seen our nation erupt once again in violence over the continuing lack of equality and opportunity for people of color. You may not remember, but it's been 53 years this month since his death. He was killed by an angry white racist who could not stand the idea that, that freedom belongs to all people. For 53 years, we have remembered this remarkable man and we have been inspired by his writings and his, and his teachings. For 53 years, we have learned the road to freedom from him. For 53 years, we have now mourned his death and, and missed his being with us, especially at a time like this when his work is most needed. For 53 years, America has felt robbed of his presence, his influence, his leadership, and today all across our nation, we wish that his dream would have come further than it has, a dream that would have overcome the injustice which continues, the riots and the violence which continue around us. And together we dream again of the world that he dreamed of, where our children would be judged not by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. But that is not the main purpose of our message today because our reading from 1 John is not about slavery or about freedom, both of which are important biblical messages. But today the lesson from 1 John is about identity, about our name, and knowing whose we are. Our name always gives us an identity and tells us who we are. I remember when I was a teenager and I was ready to go out, go out of the house on a Friday night, my dad would say, now remember you're a Schmidt. And he didn't have to fill in the rest of it. I knew that it meant we are responsible, law-abiding, God-fearing people. So don't go running around time embarrassing me. <laughs> One of the names that we hear often is the name Luther, Lutheran. Now, Luther Luke actually hated the use of, of putting his name as a title for the people that followed him. He really just wanted them to, become, to be called evangelicals. And in fact, in Germany today, you won't find a Lutheran church. The followers of Luther are known as the Evangelical Kirche, the Evangelical Church. And that is what you would be if you were a Lutheran in Germany. But the name Luther was actually given to Luther by his enemies who used it as sort of a derisive term, all those Lutherans, people who followed him. In fact, Luther tells a story that happened once when he was... Uh, when he was uh, battling some of the folks that were his enemies, there was a priest who was digging a grave in the churchyard for an older priest who had died. And as he was digging, a dog came along and <laughs> did his business in the grave. And the priest who was digging shouted out, oh no, don't tell me you have become a Lutheran too. <laughs> Luther wanted us to have no further identity than the identity that we get from God just as did the writer of 1 John from our lesson today. He said, See what love the Father has for us, that we should be called the children of God. And that is what we are. Beloved, we are God's children now. So, you may be called Elmer or Clay or Betty or Bill or June or Martin, but the name that most deeply identifies us is children of God. And we have that name because God so deeply loves us and wants to give everything to us, even his own name. We know that one of the most cruel things that people can do to other people is to label them, to give them a name that, that we think fits them. It's a natural thing to do, I suppose. We don't really mean any harm by it. We don't, have, we don't do it with any sense of malice. And yet, in the end, it really does a good bit of harm. I wouldn't believe her. She's always lying, we might say or he's not the sharpest knife in the drawer, or she's not playing with a full deck, or he's such a complainer, or she's such a whiner. He's a drunk, she's a tramp, they're all rednecks. They'll never amount to anything. Or can anything good come out of Nazareth? Yes, we do that all the time, don't we? But when we label one another, we not only limit what we can expect from those people, but we also limit what they can expect from themselves. And that's where the harm comes in. How many opportunities are lost because someone once said to another person, nah, you can't do that. You're not reliable enough. You don't measure up. You're, no, you're a quitter. You don't have what it takes. 
You ever heard those words applied to you? And then on the other hand, how many successes have been achieved because someone believed in you and they said, you can do it. I know you can. I'm so proud of the person that you have become. You did a great job. It's a, it's a pleasure working with you. I love you and I trust you completely. And then the powers of your imagination and all that you can do are unleashed. I recently read a story about the great inventor, Thomas Edison. Apparently he was a very bad student in grade school and one day his teacher sent a letter home to his mother and she says, now don't you read it, but you let her read the letter. So he dutifully takes the letter home and hands it to his mother. She opens it and the letter says, dear Mrs. Edison, Tommy, oh, excuse me, he, she didn't read it out loud. Um, Thomas watched her read it silently. And then after, after she had read it silently, he said, Mama, what did the letter say? And she said, Dear Mrs. Edison, Tommy is a genius, and we can't do anything more for him at this school, so please train him yourself at home. So after all of these years went by and Thomas Edison proved himself to be a genius, one day after his mother had died, he was going through some of her papers. He found a box with this old letter in it from his grade school teacher, and he was curious. He wanted to read it again, this time for himself. And when he opened the letter, this is what he, what he saw. Dear Mrs. Edison, Tommy is an idiot. We can't do anything more for him. You'll have to teach him yourself. Oh, what a wonderful life he had because he believed in the words of his mother who believed in him. Our friend Luther talked about names in his explanation to the Eighth Commandment. In that place, he says that we should not put people down. In fact, we should do everything we can to protect a neighbor's good name and place our trust in him. We should always explain their actions in the kindest of ways. My friends, here is a name, here is a label that you have now and you can never lose. A name that is yours forever, a name that defines you, tells you who you are, and tells you what you are worth. You are a child of God. You are sealed by the Holy Spirit and marked with the cross of Christ forever. What John wants us to know is that we are children of God. We are children of God now. We are heirs of God's kingdom along with Christ. We are his brothers and sisters. All that he has done for the world, he has done specifically for us, for, for you, for me, for each of us. His death was for us and our sins. His resurrection was for us and our forgiveness. His return will be for us and our eternal life. And when he returns, John says, we will even be like him, just like our brother Jesus. Martin Luther King Jr. had a, an African-American friend who was a, an old black preacher who once said this in one of his sermons. When we get to heaven and are standing there beside Jesus, the angels will look over and they will be confused. And they will say to one another, for the life of me. They have become so much like Jesus, I, I can no longer tell them apart. Well, most of us, probably all of us, are a long ways from that time. None of us is really the least bit like Jesus today. Yet because he claims us, we are his, and we become more and more like him. We will not make it any time in our lifetime, but when he is fully revealed to us, as John says, we will then be the person he wants us to be. In the meantime, says John, he forgives our sins and opens the gate to paradise where we will be as pure as he is. So this is the good news for us today. Christ is risen and he is risen for you. Now, right now, you are a child of God and nothing can ever take that name away from you. Amen. of the Lord, the peace of the Lord, a peace
share our faith as we confess together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Alive in the risen Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we bring our prayers before God, who promises to hear us and answer in steadfast love. Living God, in the midst of Easter joy, we are still filled with questions and wondering. Open our hearts and minds as we encounter the scriptures, so that the church embodies repentance and forgiveness in the name of Jesus to all nations. Lord, we believe. Help our unbelief. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Creating God, like a master artist, you have fashioned the universe out of your love and delight. Heal your creation where it is in need of restoration. Inspire us to clean our waters, purify our air, and safeguard our planet for the generations to come. Provide all the inhabitants of Earth a peaceful and sustainable home. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. God of all peoples, the nations hunger and thirst for your righteousness. Many call on you for guidance and strength. Answer their hopes with the peace of Christ and give your loving kindness to national, state, and local leaders of people. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Healing God. You hear the cries of those in need and answer them in your distress. Grant to those who are sick and suffering your compassion and nurse them back to health and wholeness. Be close to the hearts of the lonely. Today, we pray especially for Dan, Jerry, Keith, Lori, Brad, Jerry, and Pat, Lauren, and Jeff. We pray for Rose, Bob, Bodie and family, Fred and family. And we pray for Kent, 
and the wisdom and skill of his oncologist. Hear us, O Lord. Your mercy is great. Loving Father, though we are undeserving, you call us children of God. Reveal yourself to us so that we, in this community of faith known as Trinity, will become more and more like you in our mutual love and bold witness. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of peace, we pray today again for the coming of your great shalom upon the people of this nation. Let your love shine beyond hatred. Let it relieve anger. Let it resolve conflict. Let it restore communities. Let it replenish our commitment to love our neighbors. Bring an end to violence in our cities. Give clear-eyed wisdom to those who bear arms to protect us. Show each of us how to be agents of your peace. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. In the hope of new life in Christ, we raise our prayers to you, trusting in your never-ending goodness and mercy. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Please join together in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. It's perhaps all, almost a year since I turned to my friend Matt one Wednesday evening when we were doing songs for Wednesday evening devotion, and I said, Matt, I, I wrote a, a little benediction text for use during the period when we are not able to be together, simply to remind people that even if we can't be together, God is still with us wherever we are. And I said, how do you feel about coming up with a melody for that? Just... On the, off the cuff. So we went up to the choir room and he spent about a half an hour up there and he came down and handed me the song completed after he had added a melody to these words. We've been singing it, as, we, as I've said, for almost a year now and it is still appropriate for us as we continue to not fill the pews of this church as much as we want to and long to. The time will be coming soon when we can do that and we'll slowly begin to introduce uh, the congregation back into the building but not quite yet. And when the time is right, we will certainly let you all know. In the meantime, these words and this music seem still to, to be an important reminder that God is always with us. May the love of God be of Christ calm your heart may the flowing power of the spirit bear you up while we're apart when you need a friend God is with you when you have a prayer God will hear when you bear a pain God will share it when you're alone God is near may the love of God be with you may the peace of Christ calm your heart may the flowing power of the spirit bear you up while we're apart
peace and serve the risen ward in worship, worship, witness, and service. Thanks be to God.